Glad you tuned in for worship today. Uh, I'm taking a week off and I want to thank Doug Coven for filling in for me. I'll be watching with you. Glad you tuned in. I'll see you next week. Tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I hold When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to Stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out of grave. There's resurrection power that can save There's power in your name Power in your name There's power that can break off every chain There's power that can empty out a grave There's resurrection power there's power in your name, power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand. Thanks for joining uh, Murphy here and me. We're so happy to have you. So this is the time of year when we are celebrating independence. Well, the Declaration of Independence to be exact, thanks to its creators. But as Christians, you and I can celebrate our own independence from sin and death, thanks to Jesus. In the Bible, in John chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus tells us, If the Son frees you, you are free indeed. So we recently adopted uh, this guy here, Murphy. And when you go into a shelter, maybe you've adopted an animal from a shelter. There's all kinds of cages filled with the, well, shelter animals and they don't have a lot of freedom because they're in cages but you go in and you pay a fee and those cage doors get opened and they're not shelter animals anymore they're forever family members and they have this whole new kind of freedom but just because they have this new freedom doesn't mean they get to do whatever they want to do 
they have to learn um, the family rules. Maybe you guys have some family rules too. But Murphy here uh, is learning some rules of our house. In fact, we're working on him not waking everybody up at 4 a.m. every day. So we're working on that. Um, but the same thing is true of you and me. We were kind of in a cage of sin and death and Jesus came and he picked us and he paid the ultimate fee with his death on the cross and that cage door got opened and we became Jesus's forever family members. But just like Murphy here, we can't do whatever we want with that freedom. In fact, in the Bible, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, we are told, brothers and sisters, we were called to be free, but don't abuse that freedom. Go out and serve one another in love. In other words, even though we have this new amazing freedom from Jesus, we need to learn to live as Jesus' forever family members, just like Murphy here needs to learn how to live as our forever family member. So with freedom and a loving forever family in mind, won't you please pray with Murphy and me? <laughs> Amazing Jesus, thank you for coming for choosing us, adopting us, and opening that cage door, and uh, making us part of your forever family. Help us to never take for granted our independence from sin and death, and help us to use that resource, the Bible, that rule book, and to serve one another lovingly as we serve you. It is in your son's name we now pray. Amen. Dear Lord, we pray your kingdom come in the Lord's Prayer, but we admit that we do not do enough to make your kingdom come to earth. Help us to know your will and to be your comforting spirit, your voice of love, your spirit of justice, and your presence of peace. Amen. Friends, this would be Communion Sunday. And ordinarily, we would gather together in Communion and share it in the Lord's Supper. And I find those words to be particularly meaningful. And so, for the assurance, I decided to choose the words we normally say at Communion, which are, on the night of Jesus' arrest, he took bread, he blessed, he gave it thanks, he broke it, he said, take ye, this is my body which is broken for you. In the same way he took the cup, he said, this is the sign of the new covenant given in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. My friends, I declare to you in the name of Jesus the Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. And here in the chapel, where Reverend Ken Stewart would often lead service on Wednesday evening, and he had a saying that I particularly love, which is, it's prayer time. With that in mind, please join with me in prayer. Eternal and ever-present God, we give thanks for this day, we give thanks for this opportunity gather as your people, not physically together, but virtually together in spirit. Lord, this weekend is the anniversary of the independence of our nation. We give thanks that we can worship freely to you because of the laws of this land. We thank you, Lord, for the freedoms that the Constitution offers. We pray, Lord, that our country ever improves in granting those freedoms equally 
to all people. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to spread your word in the world. In the world. We thank you for the opportunity to live your will. We pray that we are your hands and feet, that we speak words of encouragement, of love, of justice. We speak for those who have no voice, and we join in affirmation of those who call for justice and peace. We pray that we all become your people together and united. We thank you for those who have served in military service and those who serve us in ways such as being doctors or nurses, especially in this difficult time. We are an anxious people, Lord, and we look for your guidance. We are grateful for your mercy. We thank you for the patience that we have and ask for ever more patience as we work through these times and look for ways to understand what is the proper thing for us to do. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to say when praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, what you might not know is that for the last several years, uh, the church has been following uh, the lectionary that has been uh, sent out by the Presbyterian Church. So Presbytery has a, uh, a three-year cycle by which uh, scripture readings are, are read every, every week. And over the course of three years, we cover much of the Bible. And uh, at the end of three years, the cycle repeats again. Uh, it's, it's really nice to follow that lectionary because it allows us to examine parts of the Bible that we might otherwise uh, neglect. And uh, otherwise, a pastor might always preach upon the favorite passage uh, and kind of avoid passages that they find more um, difficult to understand. And uh, that certainly is the case today, where I, I follow the lectionary, as has been our custom. And I can assure you that absolutely none of the scripture readings uh, in the lectionary for today are ones that I would have selected. Uh, I found it a very, a little bit of an inscrutable uh, set, and uh, you'll see soon. Uh, but I think it fits nicely with kind of the current times. Uh, what I've been thinking lately is, I've really been listening for what God is trying to say at this moment in time. And I must say, I have been struggling a bit. Uh, what exactly is God trying to tell us uh, right now? Um, so I think we have the opportunity to look at these scripture readings and try to make a little bit of sense. And I'll, I'll endeavor to do that uh, by looking at some things that seem a bit contradictory, actually, if you uh, kind of look at them on the surface. I know I've had conversations with uh, colleagues that are not religious, and they say, I can't trust the Bible because it is contradictory. Um, and I think my response to that is, you have to look at each passage and consider to whom that passage is being spoken. Why was it written, especially in the case of Jesus, who was Jesus speaking to when he said a certain thing? Uh, and we'll come back to that in a little bit, but uh, I want you to keep that in mind. Uh, the scripture passages are quite long, uh, so I'm going to put them here on the screen. These are the scripture readings for the uh, lectionary that uh, the Presbyterian Church has selected for today. And I'm only going to read a small portion of them. Uh, and if you wish, you can, you can look up and read them in their entirety. 
but I'm just going to read a, a few parts um, at the moment. Um, so the first from Genesis, and what's going on here is Abraham has gotten quite old, and he has sent his servant out to uh, find a wife for his child Isaac, who uh, last week we, we read about, and Abraham almost sacrificed on the mountain um, and, until the Lord intervened. And and so now Abraham is off sending his servant to find a wife for, uh, for Isaac. As is the custom uh, in, in this passage, uh, first there's the story of uh, what is going to happen, then the passage of what happened, and then the passage recounting what happened to someone else, so that those who are hearing it you know, can remember. Um, so I'm going to read just a little bit earlier than, uh, the, than the passage that the, the lectionary actually requests. Um, but the servant prayed, Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant, Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Uh, so then the passage goes on, and in fact, that does happen. And uh, uh, the servant tells uh, the woman this, and then they go to the father, and he recounts the whole story again. And eventually, this becomes uh, the wife of, of Isaac. Um, so I find this uh, a couple things that is particularly noteworthy. One is uh, the servant is basically... Uh, in, in some senses, a little bit telling God what to do. This God, I'll tell you what. You have the woman that's right say this exact thing in response to what I say, and then I'll know that this is the right woman. And uh, first time I read this, I, I found that a bit presumptuous. I'm like, is, is that kind of pleasant to have, uh, to have this person kind of bossing God around? But after I thought about it a little bit, I thought, actually, this is really quite a sign of faith. This person has complete confidence that God is present in his life, is watching over him, and wants to guide him. And this person has made it clear, I believe that you're here to guide me, and this is the sign that I will interpret. Uh, I think it shows a great deal of faith. It shows confidence, confidence in God, that God is present, wants to help, and will help. And so that's kind of the, the first point that I'd like to, to raise is that, um, you know, as I, as I said earlier, I've been kind of wondering, you know, what is God saying to us right at this moment in time? And first of all, there's the faith that God is saying something to us, that God is present, that God cares about our day-to-day -day lives and is present there. Uh, the next scripture reading is from the Song of Solomon, which I don't remember ever reading from Song of Solomon uh, before in, in the sanctuary, ever. Uh, and when we get to this uh, passage, you, I think you'll see why. I mean, those who have never taken a look at Song of Solomon, uh, you might... Uh, have a little bit of a, an awakening here and, and take a look at it. Um, uh, one of the first things I did when I was a member of this church is we participated in a small group where we uh, listened some, to some CDs discussing the Song of Solomon. And uh, this was meant as a kind of a couple's retreat um, because uh, Song of Solomon really speaks of, uh, of earthly love. Um, there are some people who want to recategorize Song of Solomon and say, this is really a book about love between people and the church or people and God. Um, when really uh, the Bible has Song of Solomon broken up between passages that say, she said this, he said that, she said this, he said that, and they are very much messages of love. Um, so we have a, a little passage here, and this, this passage comes from uh, a part that says, uh, begins with she, far above. So she is saying, 
Listen, my beloved, look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows. My beloved spoke to me, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. And it goes on and on from there. Um, uh, an unusual scripture for us to read uh, today. Um, and I'm going to jump right to uh, the, the, the epistle reading for today, which is from the book of Romans. Um, and here, uh, the, the author writes, I do not understand what to do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin that is living within me. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself and my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my flesh a slave a slave to the law of sin. So it's kind of interesting that uh, this passage in Roman is part of a longer passage which talks about not giving in to the desires of the flesh. Uh, and I found it an interesting juxtaposition. I wondered if the person who wrote the lecture, I had a little bit of a chuckle and he said, I'm gonna put Song of Solomon and the section about don't giving in to the, to the desires of the flesh. I'm gonna put those together um, uh, just to see what people have to say about it. I, I, I don't know. Um, but one thing that's interesting is that the translation here that says uh, about being a slave to the desires of the flesh, um, sometimes that is translated completely differently. And to the original listeners of this, uh, one would interpret that to mean selfishness, the desires of the body, the desires of the material world. So we might translate this more as don't give in to materialism. Um, although that really means it, to our modern ear, you know, financially, right? Don't give in to financial desires and selfishness. Uh, really, it means any kind of selfishness, putting you in front of everyone else all the time. Um, so I found these to be particularly noteworthy passages to go together. So from the point of view of Abraham's servant, where we are to be listening for the word of God and what God wants us to do, um, I would say this. Again, consider to whom things are being said. This passage uh, from Romans was written for a specific period of time to a particular congregation at the Church of Rome. Uh, in order to say very certain things. Be careful about being too selfish. Um, I often describe what I do at work. I am the manager of a software development group, and one of the things I have to do is write annual reviews. And I often wondered if people ever just read my reviews that I wrote to my employees, they would have a very difficult time understanding me. Uh, they would probably think that I'm kind of schizophrenic. Because I'll write one review that's very positive and say, but you might want to be careful because sometimes you do this thing and this isn't really very good. Um, but you know, mostly you're, you're doing pretty well, but, but you might want to spend a little time focusing on this. And another review will be much more blunt and say, look, we've talked about this. You need to change this behavior. I'm not kidding really. And the reason that those are so radically different is because I'm writing them to two completely different people. And the first one that I write to is someone who's very introspective and every small thing that I say that is in any way negative, they really jump on it. And if I'm too harsh, they get very upset. And, uh, and it's really not the behavior that I want. I just want this little thing to be improved. Uh, the other person, on the other hand, needs constant reminders 
And when I say, you know, you never took care of this, uh, they end up quoting that line from my cousin Vinny, which is, you were serious about that. So I have to be more harsh, more direct. And I think we need to consider that for the Bible, especially when Jesus is speaking. Uh, often Jesus is quoted as saying something about, about hell and damnation. And if anybody ever quotes to you about Jesus and hell and damnation, then I think you should ask them, to whom was Jesus speaking when that was said? Because I think you'll find that Jesus was mostly harsh when speaking to the religious leaders of the time who were misleading the people, who were misusing the will of God to further their own personal needs instead of being welcoming and ministering to the people. So you have, you know, at one point, Jesus says, let he who's without sin cast the first stone and be forgiving. Another time says, it'd be worse if a millstone was tied around your neck and you were thrown in the sea. Well, who is, God's, who is Jesus speaking to when that was said? And I would say I will leave with this last scripture reading, which is from Matthew. It's quite long. I'm just going to read the very, very end, which is very familiar to you. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. My friends, we are to listen for what God has to say to us. Read the scriptures, listen to sermons, and question whether, is this being said to me? And that will help you to understand. Like Abraham's servant, be mindful and have faith that God is present in your life and will guide you. That if you listen, it will be clear which messages are meant for you and which messages are not. Or they are meant for you, but not at this moment in time. But bear in mind what Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. I'm here in the choir loft where I'm often seated during the time of offering. And in fact, this is the place where I give some of my offering. Uh, these are the computers that I use to operate the slides uh, during the first service. And here is the recording deck where we record the sermons uh, to be uploaded and to be listened to by parishioners at a later time. Uh, I learned how to operate the sound uh, from Bill Cumming and from Don Roth who uh, used to do those recordings. They're all done digitally now and uploaded, uh, but for a long time they were recorded on cassette tapes. And I have here uh, just one box of cassette tapes, and I believe Don Roth recorded every single one of these sermons uh, so that they could be heard by Sunday school teachers and other people who could not attend the service. Um, and uh, I learned from him how to do this recording and now I am teaching uh, uh, Alex Martzuk, who has been operating the slides and also doing the recordings uh, for me. And a lot of other offerings are given here in the choir loft, of course, musical offerings, uh, the organ, of course, the choir. Um, and I know many of you perform offerings uh, to our church, not financially, but through, through time and talent. And of course, Financial offerings are what's keeping the doors open, the electricity on, allowing the church to continue to function, and it's doing a lot of good in the world. Our, our mission committee is still functioning quite well, and we are serving a large number of people in our congregation and without. So we thank you for your continuous uh, generosity, both in time and talent and in treasure, and we are grateful. Thank you.
you for this time together. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today. I look forward to the time when we can all gather again in person and share fellowship and Christ-like love. In the meantime, think about what God has to say to you. Look for God's message in circumstances and in the Bible. But think about what is actually being said directly to you. What speaks to you? I genuinely believe that God speaks to us if we listen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. This day, all your days, now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Mm -hmm.